always fun to come to this part of the country uh, as a Dakotan. Wrong side, I guess, that one up north, but uh, don't hold that against me. Uh, it's always fun to get out of here. I'll have to admit, haven't had, uh, for example, I think, uh, as he mentioned, uh, Dick Pruitt had spent a lot of time here, and I followed the research work at the uh, Cottonwood Station. And then uh, after that, Terry Gearing, that some of you will remember, was a student of mine that was the beef cattle specialist uh, prior to Ken Olson, worked a lot with Ken had a lot of background working with Barry on a lot of activities industry-wide, which I thoroughly enjoyed, and I and, uh, was looking forward to seeing him as well, as well as Joe here in his new role in the Animal Science Department. So it is fun to get back to the, or to, get to the Cottonwood Station. I had never been here before, and so about three weeks ago, I thought I ought to plan a little travel and uh, figure out where it was at. And so I called the West River Station, and I said, you know, I, I've not been to Cottonwood. I don't know where it's at, and the gal on the phone said, well, it's just a couple miles from the town of Cottonwood. Uh, and, uh, you know, being a guy, you don't admit that you, uh, well, of course I would know, would know where Cottonwood is at, so I immediately was uh, on my way to, to get oil changed in my vehicle, and I dug an atlas out, and, uh, and uh, I'm glad I looked, because I really didn't know if it was eight miles east of Aberdeen, 12 south of Sioux Falls, or uh, 20 north of Faith, but I now know where Cottonwood is. So, uh, but as I was, st I got to finish the story with, because it's going to talk a little about industry trends and the, the world we live in today. Uh, the, uh, I, after I pulled the atlas, atlas out, I laid it on the, uh, the, on the seat in the pickup, and I was on, and when I got to the uh, dealership, I had a high school student drive me back to work, and uh, he uh, uh, picked up the, the deal and, and looked at it, and he said, is this what I think it is? And uh, I, see, I said, what do you think it is? He said, a map? I said, yeah, it, it is a map. Uh, and uh, he said, uh, do you use one of those? I said, uh, yeah, actually, I do. Uh, he said, don't you own an iPhone? And I said, uh, I do own an iPhone, but I still use a map. And I'm thinking that night, he was with his friends, he said, you know, old people are really weird in terms of, uh, you know, they just don't get it. And, uh, but that brings me to where I think our industry, the change that's occurred in our industry, and uh, share a few ideas and some of that, that with you as we, uh, uh, it, it's amazing how this industry changes. I, I'm it, totally fascinated. Maybe it's a function of age. Maybe it's a function of a lot is occurring. But I did a lecture for a group of freshman students on the K-State campus, and I thought, you know, I'm just going to summarize what happened in the beef industry since they were in high school, in other words, the last four years. And it, it totally fascinated me if you just look at what's happened in the last four years in this industry. Uh, four years ago, early part of the year, I think this was like March or April data, so it's, it's not September data, we were looking at four years ago fed cattle prices of what? They were in that $82 to $85 range. Those of you who remember that anybody feeds cattle, 82 to 85. If we look at four years later, if any, how many of you would have thought we would sell $100.20 to $1.25, $1.28, and even occasional sales of $1.30 on fed cattle? Who would have thought that we would have probably done that? And add to that, we could sell beef for $1.25 or $1.30. And by God, we could still lose $100 a head on those cattle. Isn't that amazing? <laughs> that is amazing. But the point of it is, look how we've changed in terms of fed cattle prices, our feeder calf prices, in terms of where they have changed. But there's another little part of that that also changed, of course, and you would point out very quickly, if we're a cattle producer, and that is the corn price at that time was about 360 to 370. If you looked at a comparable period of time, we were paying over seven in the cattle feeding industry, most parts, depending if you were Texas or South Dakota, depending where you were at, in terms of, of corn prices. In other words, yeah, we saw virtually a 50, 45 to 50 percent increase in terms of cattle prices, fed cattle prices, but correspondingly, we well over doubled the price of what it was costing to feed them. And so it's, it's really the change that continues to occur in this industry, and I thought I'd touch a little bit on three or four of these points to start with, and then I want to share with you what's going on in the marketplace, the world that we live in every day, a selling beef, selling the product that uh, the great state of South Dakota produces, as, as well as the United States in general, and, and talk a little bit about the trends that are occurring. Just from a standpoint of, of a few of these type trends, we, we've already talked about 
the, the part uh, that you can overlook, and that is obviously input costs as well as, as selling prices on virtually everything that we deal with. I, uh, another example, which I always, we, take, we do a lot of work as a company of taking uh, food service uh, uh, folks uh, from the food service companies, restauranteurs. In fact, your speaker later on, Chad McKay, I met his father when I just started with the company 15 years ago at a similar event where we go out to Cockeyaf operations, we go to feedlots, we go to packing companies. And, and it's, the whole, it's that segment of the industry that wants to know more about what we're doing in agriculture, want to know more about where their food is coming from, what, how, what, what's done with those animals, how are they treated, how are they handled, all of those type of things. And we take out between 50 and, and 60 of those groups a year. I say we. Some of the folks like Paul Dykstra on our staff does a lot more of those than I do. But one of the things I always try to stress when we take a group out, if I'm interacting with them, is the investment that we have in agriculture. It's tremendous. And I'll take, for example, and say, OK, we're going to stop at a cow-calf operation. You'll find they live very conservatively, very humbly, will not brag a lot about what they own or whatever. But the point of it is, is if you look around and, and figure out what it costs to run a cow today, I'm going to share some figures with you. And if you go back four or five years ago, and it was this way for 25, 30 years, what was the land investment per cow if you were basically in Cottonwood, South Dakota, or Idaho, or uh, Ohio, Kentucky, Georgia? It really was very similar, the land investment. Now, sure, the forage changed. Here it would be short grass country, other places fescue country, other places brome, some clovers in areas. Sure, the forage type changed. The, the carrying capacity changed. In some cases, it would be uh, an acre and a half, two acres, two, two and a half acres to run a cow. Other places, it would be 12, 15, maybe 20 acres to run a cow. But the actual land investment was always in a pretty tight window. Now, there were goofy things. If you were close to a major city, sure, it would be more expensive and some of those things. But in general, it was in the range of $2,500 to run a cow, give or take three, 400 either side. That basically was that forever. All of a sudden, four years ago, that thing changed. How do you know I know what it would cost to run a cow today? But I use the example with the folks I take out. It costs about somewhere, maybe, conservatively, $7,000 today to run a cow, land investment. If you had 50 cows, which is not an economic unit, and by most standards, it's a small cow-calf operation. If you had 50 cows, you do the math, and that's a $350,000 investment just on 50 cows. Do 100, you can get, go 150, you get past a million in one heck of a hurry as size operations grow. And that really gets their attention because the typical reaction is, wow, that's more than my house in terms of running 50 cows. And, and that's the thought process that I think the folks that sell our products, retail and food service, need to understand is it's the uniqueness of agriculture, it's a huge investment, but it's also a very, it's, an, it, it's a very family orientated. The other part we really stress is this is not corporate America owning all this land. These are families that earn their living. And they're also totally fascinated on the concept of how you take the, so much of land ownership is done with the idea of passing it on to the next generation and the next generation after that. That's really the history of ranching and farming in many cases if the unit's big enough or economical to do that. And so it, it is interesting in terms of how input and, and just the whole economic structure has changed. Second area that I would mention, because I think it is so important in terms of what's going on in the beef industry today, is of course the impact of the drought, but also more related to what it did to cattle numbers. As, as, a, as a country, I would have told you two, three years ago, we would never get below 30 million beef cows in the United States. We settled last year, January 1, at 29.3, and I will tell you that almost all the data I look at and the economist friends that I hang around with will tell you that it'll go under 29 million mother cows this year come January 1. It could go well under 29 million cows in terms of, of the numbers. Now, you say, well, that's still a lot of cows. But agriculture is really built on the infrastructure of, of size. And so everything, whether it's feedlot capacity, slaughter capacity, or simply selling farm equipment, ranching equipment, 
uh, vaccines, pick any area that you want, is built on the size of this industry. And I think the part, the real question for animal agri, for the beef cattle industry, is what will we build back to? And I'll share with you a little our own thoughts, take them for what they're worth. We don't think the beef industry will build back to 32 to 34 million mother cows. It might, I hope it does, because it makes our life a lot easier in terms of trying to find cattle that qualify for the brand. But in terms of the industry, I question if it'll get back to that size. I think it will build back some if we look at, at the kind of, of situation that we're probably moving into, and I'll talk a little bit about that here in a second. And that is, it, it, I, I think we'll rebuild back. I think we'll rebuild back a couple million cows. And it's hard to project, but I don't see us going back to the significant numbers that we had before. And so that means that what we have in terms of resources to work with, whether it's land, rangeland, or the cattle we got, we're going to have to figure out how we, how we manage them as well as we can. The other thing that I think we're going to transition into that I think is very important for animal agriculture and very important for the beef cattle industry is if you say, well, what's really been the problem over the last 24 months? Well, you'd say water, drought, obviously, yes. That's, that's a key in many, many parts of the United States. But the other part that that resulted in is what? A real imbalance between grain prices and livestock prices. It's really been out of balance totally in terms of if you're on the crop side, I know you benefit from that, bless you, that's great. But if you're on the livestock side, whether it's poultry, pork, or beef, it's been extremely difficult to try to figure out a way to make that whole thing work. All the signals that we see right now is we're moving into an era of a lot better balance between those two entities. I don't know if that balance is four and a half corn or five dollar corn or where it has to be. The point is that I think it's going to be a balance and I think the net result is, the net result is for all of the proteins, beef cattle included, is that balance could create a lot better economic situation for this industry and that's not just a one year deal, that could very easily be a three to five year type window. Now, obviously a lot of things change that. Again, weather will have a huge impact. But I think that is an important part is that signals would tend to say there will be more of a balance in the industry. The another area I want to touch on, and that is global side of things. You know, we, I'm no different than most of the rest of you. I put on a, a shirt in the morning and I look on the collar and it says make it made in China and I kind of rankle up just a little bit and I think, uh, crap, why wasn't it made in, in uh, Pennsylvania, New York? Or, and then I go through that area and I see all the mills closing and being tore down and bulldozed down. And uh, you know, we live in a global world. We have to accept that. Uh, and it, it isn't gonna change. The price of wheat, the price of corn, the price of cattle could be impacted today or to next Monday by what happens in the Middle East, what happens in South America, what happens in wherever. And it is a global part. But I think the other part we have to accept in the beef cattle industry is the global part is part of, of our industry and it's going to be a big part to you. The value you see for calves and if some of those things will be impacted a lot by the global side of things. And we'll talk specifically about a few of those examples here in a little bit. And, and so as this structure of this industry changes, currently we export about 11 to 12 percent of all beef globally. We as a company are a little higher than that. We're closer to 13%. I do think from a standpoint of planning and management, we probably need to, as a company, as a brand, be looking more in that 15 to 16% range because per capita consumption, because partly price related, partly product avail availability, is gonna continue declining here in the United States. So from a market standpoint, the global side will become even more important to us. Uh, I think you're going to, and that's already happening in, in many areas. For example, the Pacific Rim. We can't sell product into China. And yet I find it most interesting that as I look at our top five international countries, they are places like Vietnam and Hong Kong. Now, when we look at what's going into those, it's not stopping in those places, it's funneling right into China. And as our people and other people travel into those, they'll walk out and they'll show them a box of certified Angus beef. And our initial question, how did that get there? We dang sure didn't send it. And the point of it is, is that that part is really looking for higher quality beef. It's also important, I think, to put in perspective in the United States, the percentage of high quality beef that's produced here compared to the total global situation. Basically, of grain-fed cattle, grain-fed cattle, about 80% of all that's produced in the United States. Folks, that's huge. That's our market. That's huge. 
And that's an opportunity that we can take advantage of from an exporting standpoint. And it's important to you from a dollar standpoint because they use cuts and parts of that carcass that we don't use here. And it adds value and subsequently price to what you receive for cattle. So the global thing is, is interesting. And I know immediately you'll say, well, what about all these countries that are building cattle numbers? I'll share with you an example. They are building numbers but they're not building the kind of cattle, the quality of cattle that you're raising here in the United States. Both quality in terms of the individual animal and how you manage them from a standpoint of nutritionally and getting them to a grain fattened type of a, of a diet that has the eating quality that our product has. What surprises me is one of our fast growing areas is South America. And you say, South America, where are there more cattle in the world than South America, Brazil, Argentina, Uruguay, Paraguay, name them all. And yet that's a market that we're really growing rapidly and developing because they don't produce high quality beef in that particular part of the world. And so we're putting a lot of product in there. It's really growing and developing. And uh, you know, it, it's fun to see some of these uh, happen. We've had a lot of interest as, as has impacted South Dakota and areas like that. The whole area, the whole old Russian Commonwealth or USSR Commonwealth is now Russia and a bunch of smaller countries. I mean, look at the impact, the relationship that, uh, that North Dakota and some South Dakotans have had with Kazakhstan's and the number of cattle that have gone over there. Look at the impact that had it. Think about what the Angus bull market was just going back a year or two and the impact it's had when Angus bulls started going to Russia and, and the, the dollar value that had changed on these sales in South Dakota, North Dakota, Nebraska, northern part of Nebraska. Because basically that part of the country is on the same kind of latitude that you are here in South Dakota. So it fits well those cattle going. What's the next thing that's gonna happen? We've sent over the breeding stock. It's gonna take a while to propagate. The next step to fill the feedlots that they're building, and they're building huge feedlots in those countries, they're building huge packing plants in Russia, is the next set of, of uh, animals to be going over there is feeder calves. Wait till some of them hits the sale barns and start buying feeder calves in terms of sending those to Russia the impact will be extremely noticeable very, very quickly in terms of a state like South Dakota and your neighboring states. And that's probably one of the next steps that'll happen here shortly as the packing plants and feedlots get completed. They will not have a cow infrastructure to be able to supply that. So we're probably looking at a two or three year type market to hit some of that uh, uh, in terms of that. So it'll, our feedlots will be competing with basically international feedlots for cattle. Fourth area I want to touch on that I think is changing so rapidly and very impactful to the beef industry, and that is genomics. This afternoon, uh, you'll have a session on DNA. I think it's really exciting in terms of, of what's going on. The, the way you'll breed cattle in five and 10 and 20 years is going to get so much more sophisticated than it is today, and it's going to be fun because you're going to be able to select for tra traits that you could never select for before feed efficiency, uh, uh, things that we basically, uh, tenderness is a case in point. We could put a lot of things in that category. Health in that category. We will have DNA markers that'll start identifying lines of cattle that are healthier, lines of cattle that are built more efficient from a feed efficiency standpoint. And that's gonna be a fun era, and it's an era that I'd really encourage all of you, all of us, to become more knowledgeable in because it's going to really impact this industry in a lot of different ways. It's going to make breeding a cattle enjoyable. I think a lot of the genetic information we have today has created cattle that are very predictable and it'll get even more predictable when you start getting down the road in terms of uh, using some of these technologies and tools. And that's where stations like the Cottonwood Station become very, very important is being able to sort through these technologies and, and share with you how they work and how they work right in your backyard. So the, the, the prospects of both the work that they do in animal science at South Dakota State and here are very impactful in terms of helping you understand and make decisions. Okay, let's move to the area of beef demand and talk a little bit about how product is moving, what's happening in that area, and then really get to the point of why is it important to you? Why do you even care? Do you, what, you know, so it's moving through restaurants and retailers it's always done that, it's a big deal. Uh, but what's going on and, and how, can, how can you, as a producer, make money? Or somebody working with the production sector, how can you benefit by what's going on in terms of changes that are occurring? Probably the biggest thing that really changed a lot 
you know, and we'd like to say the impact of our brand starting in 78, and, and we'll give you a lot of, we think we, we're proud of what we've accomplished on the premium side of the market. But the real changer, the driver, is what started occurring on the retail side like three and four years ago, and then two years ago, if we'd have been holding a conference like this, what we'd have been talking about. And that is that companies like Kroger, major, second largest, probably the largest in terms of number of stores in the United States, started going with a higher quality product, basically a premium type product, very analogous to what the CAB product is. So all of a sudden we had a major retailer in our sandbox with us. Then we also saw some of the other companies, Costco, case in point, a great marketing company. Uh, and they started selling what? Prime. Costco is selling prime beef. And it's been very successful for them. They've had a lot of success with selling prime, so they moved a whole new notch in terms of what they're making available. And then there's this little itty bitty company that's scattered around called Walmart. And they decided they had this program where they do a pump beef and it was low, lower quality select that they had a real problem with their customers, including their own help, not buying beef at their place because of the fact it was pumped, it was low quality. It was not what we eat beef for. We eat beef for flavor and they totally changed two years ago. It absolutely de disrupted the whole marketplace. Now our sandbox really got crowded. We had Kroger in there to start with, and now we got this other itty bitty little company, Walmart, hanging around our same sandbox. And so it started changing, competing for that side, that kind of product. And what you have seen is the kind of the evolution of that that impact the whole beef pricing. If you start looking at beef pricing and look at grids and how they're priced, you look back to about 2010, 2011, and then you start following the changes that occurred. So let's talk a little bit about how some of those changes have occurred and the impact it's had. A number up in South Dakota belong to programs that are excellent marketing programs uh, that offer pro, uh, premiums for higher quality cattle and I'll use one of those, U.S. Premium Beef. It's a, it's a great program, well organized, huge benefit to the national packing company, a huge benefit to our brand because a lot of our brand is generated through U.S. Premium Beef. If you look at premiums paid, when did U.S. Premium Beef start? Been around forever, right? No. It started basically about 16, 17 years ago. If you look at when they were two years in existence, the top 25% of the cattle going through there, the premium was about $24. Then that increased five years later, basically to about 2003, it increased to somewhere in the mid 40s, 45, 46. Then in basically 2008 or five years ago, that got up to about $64. In the last five years, it has virtually doubled. It is now $117 premium for the top 25%. Is that relevant to you in South Dakota? You're dang sure right, because your cattle fit that top 25%. Most cattle that'll come out of here will fit that top 25% in terms of, of, of quality. And so that $117 premium, folks, is huge. That's absolutely huge. And you can say, okay, but I'm a cow-calf producer. I, I don't see all of that. Well. That's, that's, you see some of it, it is split down. Obviously, Packer being Packer, they keep, I uh, have to admit that breeze feels pretty good, but it's causing a little, <laughs> a few problems. Uh, you know, it, it is not split, but we also follow prices of calves at sale barns. These cattle that will hit these kind of targets are bringing more at the sale barn level. So it looks to us like about a, maybe a quarter, yeah, more like a third of that is coming back to the cow-calf producer, probably potentially between 50 and 60% to the feedlots, and obviously the packer is maintaining part of those premiums that are in there as well. But there are a lot of premiums that are available right now in the industry that did not exist five and 10 years ago. That has really, really changed. And I think the thing is, as producers, and producers in a state like South Dakota, how do I get a bigger chunk of that? I think you're going to see programs just like the agent source put that were in place where there's going to be direct premiums for cattle that can hit these high quality targets that are going to be significant dollars at, that'll make it very attractive to cow calf people. And that evolution will logically start here probably in not that distant future because the feedlots have started to figure out there's some pretty dang good cattle that make money.
Okay, let's go then in terms of some of the other changes in terms of how we market. One of the other things that's going on is we have, you're well aware, we talked about the start, we've changed the price of beef. And proportionately, there are little other proteins out there, things called chicken, that if you go back just probably five and six years ago, basically the price differential, beef has always been the highest, but, but, but uh, poultry products were in general about 70, 75% lower in terms of cost per pound. Uh, if you look at more recently and how that's changed, it was always a spread, but it's done this in terms of recent years. Poultry has stayed fairly flat in terms of price per pound in spite of feed costs. Pork has gone up quite a bit. It's, it's spiraled up just like beef has. But in contrast, the spread between beef and poultry is huge today, huge. And that consumer will, will back off. And so the product you produce as a beef producer and we produce as an industry has got to be a product that satisfies that consumer. It has got to be that. I think we find more and more that consumer is very fickle in terms of the fact that they, they want, if they're gonna pay, they're gonna be paying 10 and $12 for a strip steak, that better be a good strip steak. And so the, the desire for the quality part is also what's driving this whole part because that's an expectation of the consuming public in terms of buying beef right now. Products like a, a select type product is a hard sell today. There are markets for it, but at a price and not a price that as an industry we can afford to produce it. So we've seen that evolution occur in terms of expectation. Another change that's occurred in the industry and from a marketing standpoint, which I alluded again to earlier, the consumer wants to know more about their product. They want to know how it's raised, how, what's done with it. And I think the cool part in the beef industry, we have a great story to tell. You got you folks that work with the industry in all segments. We work in this industry because of the passion that we have for cattle. You know, do you have the, if you raise chickens, do you have the same passion for raising chickens or hogs that you do for raising cattle? People are very passionate about the product that they raise in the beef industry. And I think that as that is capitalized on and communicated back to the industry, we have a real opportunity to send a great message back to that consuming public. As a brand, we're working harder on that all the time. We're trying to find ways. I said we take 50 to 60 groups out a year to the ranching operations, ranching community. Uh, we're putting together videos that'll be available in stores that sell our product in restaurants that really link that producer, link you folks back to that consuming public. Because one, once they learn what you're trying to do, they're gonna be very accepting in terms of, of how good a job as an industry you do. We have very little to hide. And that's, that's a neat part of, of all aspects of beef production. And lastly, to kind of wrap up in terms of some other ch uh, trends, and Chad McKay, I'll get into this, you'll enjoy his comments and share with you a little bit, uh, I know this will be part of the introduction later, but why restaurants like that are really important to the cattle industry. And that is the El Gacho restaurants that Chad and his father own are, I know some of you have been in very nice restaurants in your lifetime. I assure you, you've not been in a nicer restaurant than the El Gaucho restaurants. They are outstanding. They are the nicest restaurants anywhere in the United States I have ever been in. They are truly outstanding. They do an outstanding job marketing beef, and he'll share with you some of the things that they do. And why that's so important to you is because of what he can do in marketing price, uh, beef at a price, is what allows calves to be, bring the dollars they bring at weaning time, or be at the time they come out of the feedlot, it's restaurants like that that can sell this quality to the consuming public that are critically, critically important to this industry. So you'll enjoy the comments on his end. And, and as we work with restaurants like Chad and retail stores, share a few things that we we're having to do as price of beef has, has escalated. One of the media things that's happened to beef is the, the almost reinvigoration of ground beef. Ground beef is a hot commodity in terms of, uh, ground beef used to be ground beef and we kind of competed for our fair share of the market. And certainly with the advent years back of McDonald's, Hardee's and so on, Burger King, they brought a lot of focus to, to ground beef. We've had a new focus enter into it and that's what we call premium grinds that have become so important to the industry that it's now a tier in itself. 
So what's premium grinds? Premium grinds are taking your younger cattle, some of your higher price cuts that would maybe go into other pro uh, uh, beef products, and grinding them and making a premium grind. Sometimes uh, called blends. This always fascinates me is that a brisket tastes totally different than a chuck. Uh, a chuck tastes totally different than a sirloin. I didn't used to believe that. As an old meat lab guy, I said ground beef, 80-20 ground, or ground beef is ground beef. Didn't matter if it came from an old cow, a young calf, top round, chuck, ground beef was ground beef. That is not true. There's a total different flavor profile in terms of these, and they start using blends and combinations. And that's led to, to a whole new marketing group of restaurants called Smash Burger, Five Guys, Hard Rock, groups like that that are doing a tremendous job of selling your product. When I look at what we're with one Smash Burger, I look at the amount of our ground beef that goes into their company. It's amazing how much product they will sell. Absolutely amazing how much product they get done. And so ground beef is a real success story for the beef industry. And it's a success story because it used to be ground beef at a quarter cent a pound, if there was that kind of difference, packers and food service people would argue all day over a quarter cent a pound. Now look at what premium grinds bring relative to choice grinds, as an example. Right now, for this year, it'll average 14 cents so far. It's been as high as 18 cents. You start taking that times 60, 80 pounds or more of a carcass, and that ends up being real dollars in terms of value that it can bring to our industry. Premium grinds are really a hot item and selling extremely well and mean more dollars to from a carcass standpoint. The other thing we've had to do, and this is compliments to the beef check off, your money, and that is all the new cuts that are available. Flat irons. Your mother's and your grandmother's pot roast was what? It was made up of what's called terrace majors and flat irons and that type of thing. We pulled those muscles out, found they were very tender. Well, they were very tender when you ate them from grandma's pot as well, but she cooked them forever. Now we find that you can actually cook them just like steaks, and they actually eat extremely well. So one of the things that's key at restaurants is how can we take those and, and do a better job of taking cuts like that, adding value to them, but adding value to the user, the restaurant that puts them in front of people and creates a great beef, beef eating experience. And so a lot of what we have to do is the whole training, education in that particular area, recipes, those type of things. And, and that's what our marketing people do, and that's really what's helped the restaurant retail side of the industry be successful in terms of handling some of those type cuts. So it, it is, it's, there's a lot of change that has occurred on the marketing side. I think there's a lot of change is gonna continue. Uh, but I think these trends that we're seeing are gonna be with us for a while. Appreciate the opportunity to share some of that with you in terms of uh, uh, an event like this. <music>